remember the show. There, there was a show kind of where kids interviewed kids. Um, I was talking about that too, but it was a long time ago. It was a long time ago, and I think it was more on Nickelodeon um, where they did that because kids interviewing kids on Sesame Street is too much of a break from, from what the, the traditional Sesame Street is. Back in the day when they had other shows, like I worked on Three Tone Contact, and you know, that was all that they had. Yeah. So they had um, kids who were scientists, and they would go out and they would interview scientists, and they were older, and you know, and then we'd have a lot of uh, different curriculum around, around um, about kind of whatever that, that particular season was focused on, if it was oceans, or if it was, you know, observation, or, you know, the galaxies, you know, mm -hmm. there'd, there'd be um, short films and scientific, um, scientific pieces around that. But, yeah, they, Sesame isn't doing that at the moment. They are trying to put into production a new series that's in the Sesame mold, but that is kind of fresh and moved away from the character. I should, there's some way to connect you. Yeah, sure. I'm just they'd be so thrilled. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 It's like, yeah. yeah. But I mean, really, it's um, Sesame over the last 10 years, I guess, has been. I left, uh, I, I left seven years ago. I, I left for another job. I wanted to, to try. And um, they really just, there's been a real, you know, overhaul or refreshment of um, people who are producing the show. And it's really young, and um, there's, like, there's a lot of opportunity for many years. There just was an opportunity. But now there is? That's yeah. So yeah, I think so. I think so. In fact, there was just a, a writer's workshop that... Uh, so for me, I'm, I am interested in children's programming, also children's books, multimedia. Obviously, I'm thinking in terms of photography, film. You know, that's just sort of my my skill set. Right, right. So, so what are you? Um, what classes are you taking here? Here, I'm taking a children's picture books. Oh, nice. Yeah. With Katie Kleist. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Great. So Very that one, and um, also I think narrative fiction. Mm -hmm. And I've already taken a, a short narrative. Course, mm -hmm. and uh, I think what I learned was when you're writing about your life, the people in your life, mm -hmm. you have to think about, oh my God, how are they going to feel about it? You know. Right. So now I feel like I want to sort of go through another sort of channel. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Yeah, it does make sense. Yeah. Like, it's so interesting now because um, I mean I started out as a photographer also, mm -hmm. and then I went into film because I kept on making a series of photographs and wanted to tell a story with my photographs. And you know, back in the day of celluloid and you know, kind of I remember celluloid. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> celluloid and and dark rooms mm -hmm. and you know, kind of a fixed medium pretty much. Um, you really didn't have the option to do as many things as you can do now with a photograph. You know, you can colorize it, you can print it in an abstract, you can you know, you can put it into Photoshop and do just about anything. You can make it look like a, a children's illustration. And there, I think it's just, you know, the new media, the, the media around children's TV, um, around children, the media around children's books is just endless now. And if you want to tell stories, you can tell stories. Right. Um, yeah, I think uh, it's, a, it's a really, Especially taking, if you've been photographing children all, all the time, um, it would be really, be really fun just to see. I think, I mean, to me, a book with just a lot of really diverse children's faces, you know, so that you have something that just is about diversity in a way, like in an mm -hmm. implicit way. Right. Like that, that's a great thing to have as a parent. You know, with your kids, right? And to sit down and talk about, you know, all the different children who are friends in a book or something. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I 
and I went back recently because I'm doing this one now. Um, it's all about networking, 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 yeah. networking, oh, yeah. networking. That's you the key. You have a big leg up. I do. Oh, I do. Yeah. I do. I mean, Spider, when I was there, I mean, again, he's really, he's a hermit. He doesn't even go out hardly anymore. He lives on a Bowen Island in this little house. But the one, the w week that I was there, for some reason, he was talking to the New York Times editor oh. about something. So he mentioned, you know, my sister in law is trying to, you know, publish my daughter's book. So you're right. I mean, that, but if you can think about that, well, and then, but you have to, you have to have the, to, to ask, <laughs> and I do actually. <laughs> I didn't used That's to, but now I do. I'll tell you what whisper I have. Mm -hmm. I um, I sent my book to Ellen DeGeneres. Oh, good for you. Yeah. I sent it to her, and I the said, action. and I said the covering letter saying, I had a dream that you wanted to do. A program what what teachers do when they retire. Oh, Here's yeah. what I did when I retired. Oh, so I'm so still so waiting funny. to hear from Ellen DeGeneres. <laughs> so cool. But you have to. Yeah. 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 So I have a list, you know, of people that I want to ask to do the book jacket work yeah. because if you send a letter Testimonial. to an agent, oh, yeah. they're they're just called you know, whatever they're called, book jacket reviews is kind of the word yeah. Steve used. You know, and so, you know, obviously Spider Robinson, who's, you know, um, Bernie Siegel, who's written so many, yeah. you know, love it. Terry was in his exceptional cancer patient mm -hmm. group. So, you wow. know, there's a, but I have to take the time to write a letter and yeah. ask him, you know, this is Lori, and, you know, he, so again, it's did a lot, it's a full time job. Did you also <laughs> know that I didn't know this until recently? How do you get a Kirkus review? Because, no. You pay. You pay, you send them the book, and Kirkus reviews it for you. Wow. Well, there's a lot of it you pay for. Yeah, 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 but I didn't know that. I said, oh, who are these people? How do they pick up on your book, you know? Mm. Right. So that's on the back of some of the books? Yeah, when you read, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Some, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's quite an interesting journey. It is. And it's great to hear from people. I, I don't, I'm not in a writer's group, and I, I probably should try to do that. I should try to, you know what I mean? It's like, it feels like, I'm just sitting here with you guys. I've already learned so much. Sure. Uh, which group is this that you're? Actually, it's a memoir group that's organized by the Writers Center here. Mm. So, uh, if you're looking to join a group, you might want to talk to Barbara Struna. I know Barbara. Yeah. What groups are already out there? Right. Yeah, I know there are several of them, but this is a memoir group, mm -hmm. and where do they meet? Um, in Yarmouth. Okay. How large is it? <laughs> Shrinking. Um, one of our members went off to Columbia. The um, nerve. <laughs> yeah, the nerve, exactly right. Um, and I think, you know, now that I've pretty much finished writing, I'm probably going to be stepping out. So there's like three of us left. Oh, I see. But it's been very helpful. We are looking for the members. Okay. Good. Let's talk. <laughs> right. Networking. Let's talk. Yeah. yeah. There we go. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, our time is up here, guys. Oh. And um, thank you for sharing. Thank yes. you for sharing. Oh, I'm here next thing if you want to sign. For me, I would never go up to somebody and say, hey, listen, I'm looking for an agent. I would not. I would make sure they remember me. So when I drop them an email this week and say, hey, listen, I'd love to send something along. And everybody say, you make that connection, but you don't have to stop the call to be that relationship. I was going to say that, you know, I'm working on something. It's not complete. Yeah. I want to leave it. Then I want to contact these agents. Yeah. I don't want, I've got the program. I'll just use it. Say, you know, CCWC. What's, what, I'm sorry, what's your name? Diane. So Diane, here's what you want to do, right? All five of those agents, make sure that you shake each man's hands this weekend. Yes. Right? We came in, her name was Pelopia, that was Pia, right? Sharon? Yes, Sarah. Twice. Hi, nice Steve Manchester, nice to meet you, this and that. Hey, Steve Manchester. And they look at you like you have three heads, right? <laughs> but she's going to remember it. So when I drop her a line, and I can't drop her a line in six months. If I drop her line this week or next week, she's going to remember, oh yeah, I was at the Cape Cod Writing Center. So you make a connection, right? Yeah. Like, I'll tell you, I've gone after agents, publishers, because if I love sea kayaking, which I don't, but if I did, and this person loves sea kayaking, I'm going to make sure it's part of the conversation. You have to make <laughs> connections, right? I'm a veteran. I have a background in law enforcement. If somebody has something similar to that, then I make that connection. You, it's, a, it's a human thing. Because when people look at you, it's not just about your book. It's, do I want to work with this person? Go ahead. You write under a suit. Introduce yourself to the real name of the pursuit. 
Yeah, I let them know that I'm writing the uh, under assuming that this, this is my real name. But when I contact you, it will be another name when I contact you. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Brent Swan, Anthony Ellen. We'll be here till Thursday, folks. Try to be All right, so if you guys need me, just drop me a line. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Be very interested in his activities. No threats, of course, but a shot across the bow. This warning is only the beginning. Second, after exposing Laxalta Pharmaceuticals' drive to undercut the double-blind study of a drug to alleviate PTSD in, <clears throat> in veterans, Tom was vulnerable to propaganda. Campaigns from pharma, I'm sorry, vulnerable to propaganda campaigns from pharma. He redoubled his efforts as the pressure mounted. There were threats on his life and of his board members. Three, Senator Belmont heard of his plight and convened a Senate hearing to investigate the entire drug industry. The hearings led to a new legislation to further regulate the industry. Thoughts? I want to know what happened with the PTSD drug. Do you include that, that in your own internal? Um, uh, that, that was in, in my previous novel. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, sorry. So that's all right. Yeah. Um, the PTSD drug was successful. Okay. Other thoughts? It needs something else. I don't think there's something missing. It sounds like a news kind of story rather than an arc, you know, a, mm -hmm. a novel with an arc, a story right. with, a, with a conflict. I mean, there is a conflict, obviously, but it sounds like, you know, a piece in the New York Times or something. I didn't get the plot complication. Well, the threats against okay. his life. Um, but when he was already, he was already getting, you, he comes into the story pretty in bad. You're right. So then the plot complication shouldn't be, he's in bad. I think this is a terrible idea. I'm not suggesting that you actually do this. But, it, you know, it, something is wrong with, with with his drug that makes him vulnerable to um, you know, to, to, to a successful attack. Um, there is, I'm, I, as I said, these are terrible ideas, don't use any of them. <laughs> um, you know, there, there is somebody on the other side that leaks information to him that, that allows him to, to battle the situation, or there's somebody in his organization who's actually working. You know, all of those, mm -hmm. those typical bad ideas for, for, for hoping, <laughs> hoping not with. But well, I'm, I'm only throwing them out because that sort of thing is the kind of left turn that a suspense novel needs in order to ratchet up the suspense to the point where you're not sure. I mean, one of the things when writing suspense, and it's, it's something that, that, that is applicable to all fiction, but when writing suspense, the assumption, overwhelmingly, is that the protagonist is going to prevent. Is what? Is going that, to prevent. Yeah, that, that in virtually every suspense novel that anybody ever reads, the good guy wins. Save the cat. <laughs> so, you need to put some doubt into the reader's mind that either says to them, wow, maybe this is going to be one of those stories where the, where the, the good guy doesn't win, or how is he going to win with with this happening? And I think that's where that's what your plot your plot complication needs to be of that level, so that you get us to the point where we're saying, how's he going to get out of this? I don't understand how he could possibly get out of this this situation. Or maybe he's not going to get out of this situation. You know, both of which are great things to have the reader thinking through Act Three of the story. So, other other thoughts. How about thoughts on the process? I'd love, I'd love some, some how does how's this feeling to you in terms of? Well, this is, this is feeling magnificent, mm -hmm. except uh, 10 minutes is Oh, well, of course, of course it is. <laughs> so, which is why, so well said. No, and if you had, if, if, it, if what your comment is about 10 minutes, I, I hear you and you're totally right. Well, let, let, let me, let me stay in my remarks. Okay. <laughs> when I got your email, 
you sent me down and, did, and caused me to do something that I have consistently failed to do for months and months and months. Okay. okay so that's this first paragraph. Now, I look at it and it's easy. This is pretty thin. But then this, what you're talking about now, extends that where I'm confronted with, yep. this is what's holding you back, stupid. So that process, that's my remark. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I just added um, a revelation about a character that affects the main character, mm -hmm. but I'm now worried that that revelation about the character changes that character too much, or it's coming out of left mm -hmm. field, or, you know, it's... It changes the main character? No, it changes that second character. Okay. That maybe it's... It, I've made that character... No, but you just hit on something really important, and again, we're going to get to it tomorrow, but it's, it's worth discussing now. Now is when you figure out that I need the character to do that. And the character I've had in my head all along would never do that. Right. But I need the character to do that. Mm -hmm. So you either have one of two choices, give up, or create, <laughs> which is definitely a legitimate response, <laughs> um, or change the character from the start. Reimagine that, that character so that that character would do that. Right. Or come up with a different plot complication. <laughs> Also, yeah. yes, right. yes. But if you love the plot complication, mm -hmm. fixing the character at this point, fixing the character is a whole lot easier than coming up with a plot complication that you're also going to love. Yeah. <clears throat> so here's what I'd like to do. Um, what we're going to do, just as a preview tomorrow, we're going to keep taking this out, but we're going to take it out beyond the, the possible range of, of something that you could do in class. Um, we'll discuss all these things, things and I'll give you examples and that sort of thing. Um, the way this plays out is that it goes to two pages, then it goes to five pages. And then you still don't get to start right. But, but because we have two other significant things that we've got to do before we get, get right. What I'd love to do is start tomorrow with a few more examples of these three paragraph pieces. So if you guys could go, I, I totally understood 10 minutes was ludicrous to, to, to do, but I also didn't want to be just having, you know, sitting here in class not doing anything. Um, well, me not doing anything. You guys are actually very interested in his activities. No threats, of course, but a shot across the bow. This warning is only the beginning. Second, after exposing Laxalta Pharmaceuticals' drive to undercut the double-blind study of a drug to alleviate PTSD and <clears throat> in veterans, Tom was vulnerable to propaganda. Campaigns from pharma, I'm sorry, vulnerable to propaganda campaigns from pharma. He redoubled his efforts as the pressure mounted. There were threats on his life and of his board members. Three, Senator Belmont heard of his plight and convened a Senate hearing to investigate the entire drug industry. The hearings led to new legislation to further regulate the industry. Thoughts? I wonder what happened with the PTSD drug. Do you well, include that, that, that in your own internal? Uh, um, that that was in, in my previous novel. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sorry. So that's all right. Yeah. Um, the PTSD drug was successful. Okay. Other thoughts? It needs something else. I don't think there's something missing. It sounds like a news kind of story, rather than an arc. You know. Mm -hmm. a, a novel with an arc, a story right. with, a, with a conflict. I mean, there is a conflict, obviously, but it sounds like you know a piece in the New York Times or something. I didn't get the plot complication. Well, the threats against okay. his life. Um, but when he was already, he was already getting. You, he comes into this story pretty in bad. You're right. So then, the plot complication shouldn't be. He's in bad. I think. This is a terrible idea. I'm not suggesting that you actually do this. But, it, you know, it, something is wrong with, with, with his drug that makes him vulnerable to, um, you know, to, to, the, to a successful attack. Um, there is, I'm, I, as I said, these are terrible ideas. Don't use any of them. <laughs> um, you know, there, there is somebody on the other side that leaks information to him that, that allows him to 
to battle the situation, or there's somebody in his organization who's actually working. You know, all of those <laughs> those typical bad ideas for, for, for hope, <laughs> Hopi novels. But well, I'm only throwing them out because that sort of thing is the kind of left turn that a suspense novel needs in order to ratchet up the suspense to the point where you're not sure. I mean, one of the things when writing suspense, and it's, it's something that, that, that is applicable to all fiction, but when writing suspense, the assumption overwhelmingly is that the protagonist is going to prevent. Is what? Is going is that, to prevent. Yeah, that, that in virtually every suspense novel that anybody ever reads, the good guy wins. Save the cat. <laughs> so, you need to put some doubt into the reader's mind that either says to them, wow, maybe this is going to be one of those stories where the, where the, the good guy doesn't win, or how is he going to win with, with this happening? And I think that's where, that's what your plot, your plot complication needs to be of that level. So that you get us to the point where we're saying, how's he going to get out of this? I don't understand how he could possibly get out of this, this situation. Or maybe he's not going to get out of this situation. You know, both of which are great things to have the reader thinking through act three of the story. Good. So, other, other thoughts? How about thoughts on the process? I'd love, I'd love some, some how is how's this feeling to you in terms of well, this is, this is feeling magnificent, mm -hmm. except uh, 10 minutes is... Oh, well, of course. Of course it is. <laughs> so, Which is why, so well said. No, and if, you have, if, if, it, if what your comment is about 10 minutes, I, I hear you and you're totally right. Well, let, 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 me, let me expand my remarks. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> when I got your email, you sat me down and, did, and caused me to do something that I have consistently failed to do for months and months and months. Okay. okay so that's this first paragraph. Now, I look at it and it's easy. It is pretty thin. But then this, what you're talking about now, extends that where I'm confronted with, yep. this is what's holding you back, stupid. So that process, that's my remark. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Yeah. I just added um, a revelation about a character that affects the main character. Mm -hmm. But I'm now worried that that revelation about the character changes that character too much, or it's coming out of left field, or you know, it's it changes the main character. No, it changes that second character. Okay. That maybe it's it, I've made that character. No, yeah. but you just hit on something really important, and again, we're going to get to it tomorrow, but it's, it's worth discussing now. Now is when you figure out that I need the character to do that. And the character I've had in my head all along would never do that. Right. But I need the character to do that. Mm -hmm. So you either have one of two choices, give up, or create, <laughs> which is definitely a legitimate response, <laughs> um, or change the character from the start. Reimagine that, that character so that that character would do that. Right. Or come up with a different plot complication. <laughs> also, yeah. yes. Right. yes. But if you love the plot good. complication, mm -hmm. Fixing the character at this point, fixing the character is a whole lot easier than coming up with a plot complication that you're also going to love. <clears throat> so here's what I'd like to do. Um, what we're going to do, just as a preview tomorrow, we're going to keep taking this out, but we're going to take it out beyond the, the possible range of, of something that you could do in class. Um, we'll discuss all these things and I'll give you examples and that sort of thing. Um, the way this plays out is that it goes to two pages, then it goes to five pages. And then you still don't get to start writing. But, but because we have two other significant things that we've got to do before we get, get right. What I'd love to do is start tomorrow with a few more examples of these three paragraph pieces. So if you guys could go, I, I totally understood 10 minutes was ludicrous to, to, to do, but I also didn't want to be just having, you know, sitting here in class not doing anything. Um, well, me not doing anything. You guys are actually going to do this very quickly, and then I'm going to ask you to give me a little quick feedback for what we want to do tomorrow. Um, instead of having you tell me your ideas, I'm going to have everybody tell me what's the good idea you heard from your, what's the idea that you, you were interested in from your peers. So why don't you start first? With you. With you. Yeah? Okay, go ahead. No, he was talking about.
experience you had at Jane was um, getting to know a fashion model as a photographer mm. and photographing her and did have a friendship with her. And then at a point in her life, she developed breast cancer. And he got to know her um, through her experience with this and got to experience and hear from her the effect it had on her and her personality. And this happened in stages from one breast to another. And his helplessness, his sense of helplessness, absolutely stopped. Can you help it all? That's a, that's a great topic because, right, we, we think about fashion models as these sort of perfect, flawless creatures who are physically, you know, perfect in some ways, and, and you saw this. So you, that article both gives us a glimpse into what life is like as a fashion model, which most of us had no idea about that, but then it's also got this other story element to it. That's a great idea. I like it. Did you not get to your idea? Or? Well, yeah, we started talking about it in Japan, just kind of in the middle of it. All right. And, uh, <laughs> Something about Japan. Okay. I like that. Yeah. Now. Your experience in, in Japan. It was going to Japan with a group of teachers to visit Japanese schools and yeah. Japanese educators. But I was older than most of my colleagues who were in the group. And I had experiences growing up as a young child when people were continually talking about the war. Uh -huh. I remembered old movies made during mm. World War II. in my head that was never going to speak. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's a good, again, I mean, most people will not have been there, um, and you've got a particularly kind of unique angle on that. I like it. Go ahead. Um, um, so I heard from Betsy about, um, she found out a good friend of hers uh, when she's only in high school. She learned over the radio that a good friend of hers had died. Names two or three day and uh, yeah wow. two or three day yeah. thing but what I was most remark I mean that was all interesting but at four a.m. they brought in the people that introduced us to it and they'd been out there waiting all this time wow. to be there for us and to me that was the most remarkable yeah. thing yeah. I mean it's not something I'd ever do again yeah. well, do you want us to do something with that what is this yeah, what uh, is that why do you keep moving this around it's just a microphone it's distracting I, I won't no no it's okay but I'm just we're gonna keep moving so. <laughs> <laughs> that would be awesome. Okay, all right. You guys, go ahead. Well, I'm not just interested in what he's doing. He's going to talk about stabbing himself when he was seven. So, that's not unusual. Sure, okay. That's what he's going to say. Well, say it a little bit louder. He's going to talk about a stabbing he saw when he was seven. And children, children don't often see such violence in the first place. And when they do, do they have no memory? Yeah. That's my question. That, I want Okay, to I'm curious about that too. So you, you got my attention there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's all the further we got because I said something about seven being the age of reason and he started questioning me about why I thought that. Yeah. And I said it was Catholic Church upbringing that made me think seven was the age of reason. Yeah. Well, there is something, our brains kind of turn a corner at the like five, six year old spot, but you can't really remember too much before that. But at that point, we start being able to form. And her story was about a uh, 
a, a family history or genealogy uh, that she's trying to uh, come up with a concept for. Uh, she comes from a, uh, a town in upstate New York that keeps very good records. No, I don't come from that town. That's where the genealogy is written. Oh, that's where the genealogy That's where the problem lies, too. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I come from yeah. But well, one of the stories, the, uh, I believe it was the genealogist in, was writing, yeah, in the first was about Mad, Mad Meg, who, uh, who was a ferry, who ran the ferry. I don't know if this was up on Lake Champlain or where it was, but she ran the, uh, the ferry, and she went around living with relatives rather than living in her own place. When she died, uh, she ended up in her own house, but they found uh, a fortune buried in the wall. Okay, that's a good story. <laughs> there, there, there are like at least three good reasons why that's a good story. Yeah. But then. that's in the first volume, and I want to know, because she separated it, it your time shifts. Yeah, she yeah. told you a little bit, then she told you a little bit more, yeah. and then finally okay. this yeah. ironic yeah. ending. Yeah. You know, I don't. I mean, she was very educated, so I'm sure she knew what she was doing. Is that? That's probably one of the ways she keeps us reading that yeah, genealogy absolutely. as absolutely. as a genie as a story yeah. instead of just the intertwining disparate. narrative, yeah. where you get a little bit of the story, then you get something else, then you get a little bit more. That's a very common strategy. Okay, that's I a was good. just hoping that I could find some stories in that. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you will. I'm sure you will. <laughs> what about you guys? Uh, she was talking about. Uh, a manufactured experience. Uh, he never was interested in economics and, uh, and that side of things and wanted to place himself in that type of an environment uh, where, where it was uh, outside his comfort zone, a little more challenging, and uh, gave him the opportunity to learn some things uh, about economics and, and so forth that uh, would benefit him, but also uh, he could uh, share to help other folks. All right. I thought that was cool. Yeah. And I guess we move. Oh, you got a little time. Yeah, yeah it's here. Okay. Yeah. okay, great. Okay. Uh, again, I uh, focused on, uh, on Rick's um, manufactured experience. Um, I've, I've, I've seen his, his pictures. We know each other a little bit. I, I know he's a guy who says, um, uh, go to some place the other side of the rail right. I want, what do I do there? I don't know. I'll figure it out then. <laughs> and that, that sort of thing. And um, in, in, in this case, uh, what he's doing uh, is uh, he's going to put himself in a very rigidly disciplined place instead of the freewheeling one, uh, becoming effectively one of the crew of a steamboat on the Mississippi. Oh, that's, that's good. Yeah, that's good stuff. Yeah. Becoming a crew on a steamboat. Come on, that's a great manufacturing experience. I love it. <laughs> You'll get something good out of that for sure. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I think uh, we talked about her uh, describing similar to what uh, another group talked about, of hearing the words, you have cancer, yeah. and trying to uh, you know, share that experience and that uh, emotion of uh, those words, those few words yeah. have probably uh, greater impact on people than almost any yeah. other and words. It's a, and it's a perennial experience, right? Like, there'll always be a new audience for people. For <coughs> So um, another manufactured experience, um, and I had had a similar one, um, being in Acapulco and being concerned about losing your wallet, your money, and so forth. Um, he and his girlfriend had locked all their everything up and then um, needed to take a bus without any money and realized, well, as a matter of fact, they'll just let you on and, um, you know, People are sharing food, and you know, there's sort of a not lawlessness, but the, yeah. the sense that you can get by with very little um, when you don't have anything. Um, you just Absolutely. there's a lot of people doing that life. Great sort of dramatic opening. How do I get on a bus with no money and <laughs> no reason? That's a perfect sort of you know great dramatic opening, and then to, to draw the lesson from that. Perfect to expand on Okay, Holly and Barks. Holly embarks on a what should be uh, to Custer Park, Custer Park with her family to have a nice time with them, and she is in the bird, has a bird's eye view of a wild bull uh, who has also part of his family with him, and all of a sudden the bull looks up and um, starts to rush the fence, sees the fence, and Holly's car and family is right there, 
and um, it's an interesting end. Uh, and what hap what ha what Holly has put together is that she had very little place to go to get out of the way, and the bull doesn't have much much place to go either because it's stuck in this restricted area, and it's just by who knows what, by some mystery that this bull stops within 15 feet of her car. Okay, that's a good dramatic opening in the park. Custer State Park. Yeah, it was, um, it was a buffalo bull. Yeah. Oh, a buffalo bull, yeah. yeah. Okay, you've got, you've got the opening of a great story there. You know, my family's here, uh, uh, and a buffalo is charging at me. And there's no more I mean, that's it. That's your opening <laughs> sentence. That's going to catch an editor's attention. Yeah. Yeah. Now, where do you go with that? that? That's one of the things that we'll think about tomorrow. You know, is there a National Parks magazine? That we, and that's the kind of thing to think about. Okay, and then last. And then she had the unusual experience of um, tr really trying to save a woman's life in a hospital hallway huh. because nobody else was around and this woman was going to die without some quick resuscitation effort on the part of a stranger. And then when doctors do rush in, they do everything wrong, the woman dies. <laughs> so I, I don't know why I'm laughing. Yeah, I know, because, yeah, no, I know. But that is, an, okay, we've got another dramatic story here. And this is another thing that we're, we'll look at this tomorrow, is thinking about openings and closings of our creative nonfiction pieces. Um, and I heard some fantastic, dramatic openings um, from some of you guys today. Um, okay, so what we're going to do tomorrow is, um, so what, if you have time, I know that there's a lot of things, when you take the other class. That galley, so you want to write that down. That galley is absolutely phenomenal, and it's a free service. Uh, fortunately, I work with a publisher who's very good, so he'll actually set it up for me. But 30 days prior to the release of the book, he will throw my novel up on that galley. So people like librarians, teachers, right, professors can actually go and pull down the book. So it's either you know, a PDF file, or it's an EPUB file, or, or a movie file, which you can read on Kindle. We'll bring it down and, and provide a review and start that, yeah, listen, we're going to buy this thing or whatever. But NetGalley is another way to go out and get reviews. And I know I'm kind of honing in on the review stuff here, but in the beginning, that's really what you need to concentrate on, right? The target was, and this is, this is going to make me laugh, but first time we ever hired a book blog tour, the woman said I could do 40 of them. I thought, fantastic, right? I could probably triple that. Because it's a query letter. It's the same query letter you've been pitching right along, right? You're going to do synopsis, you pitch it into an agent, to the publisher, that ends up going on the dust jacket of your book, which is now pitching it to the consumer. So when you follow that all the way down the line, that pitch is the pitch is the pitch is the pitch. Hopefully you polished it as you're going, but that pitch is really what it's about, right? So for me, if I say if she's going to do this for 40 people and I can go off and research, you know, here's, you know, and you have to know the, the book in which you swing, right? So I, I write for a certain demographic. I'm not going to, to pitch my project, even to a book blogger who just likes fantasy. I don't like fantasy, right? I write fiction, you know, that, that's you know, commercial fiction or you know, modern fiction stuff. So I go after people that I know, at least it's in their wheelhouse. They may not like the book, but at least it's in their wheelhouse. Uh, so she does 30 or 40, I'll do 100, 120. Not all of them will produce a review, but if 80, 90 of them do, most of them go on Amazon and Bonds and Mobile. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And we're done with paper now, right? So this is all email. This is email based. Some of them actually have these wizards where you can kind of, you know, you know, fill out a, a quick survey and then they'll get back to you. Um, my name is uh, obviously Stephen Manchester, right? You might want to take this down. My email address is stephen.h.manchester at sunlight, one word, sunlight.com. If you drop me a note, uh, I will turn you on with some book blogs to get you started. People are approachable, accessible, and as kind as they are true to mind. There are people who are going to read your stuff and say, listen, we don't want to read anything. And the only answer to that is thank you. Right? And there are a lot of people, a lot of people that come to me now, hey, you can endorse my book. If I have the time, I will absolutely do everything I can for a spider writer. That's the truth. It's, you know, common place into it too, right? But if I don't like it, <coughs>
Matt Galley's huge. At least check it out. You can send out a book, and it's, it's not going to cost you anything, right? So it's an e-file, electronic version of your book. They upload that book. Next thing you know, you have librarians that are reading it. Teaches. Phenomenal. Goodreads. You guys know what Goodreads is? Yeah. Awful. Yeah. Oh, I'm good one. Awful. <laughs> it's a piranha tank, right? So when you put your book out on Goodreads, and it needs to be there, put it on Goodreads, never go back and read the reviews, ever. <laughs> right? Because a lot of these people are frustrated writers, right? Some of these are, and they are unkind. And I've had people read my stuff. It's not for you, it's not for you, I get it, right? You have to grow somewhat of a thick skin if you can do this. But for me, there's a difference between cruelty, you know what I mean? And for me, it rolls off like a duck's back, right? So it was. But, uh, <laughs> it's, like, it, it's like one of these things. But Goodreads, it is a trick of Goodreads, phenomenal to do giveaways. So if you say, listen, and when I say a giveaway, if I'm giving my book away, you're probably not going to get a physical copy of it. You're probably going to get an electronic copy, because most people read off of a Kindle or a Nook or, or you know, and I read it now anyway, an iPad. So it's easy to give off those electronic copies. Goodreads will actually stop to promote your book and give it away. What do you get if you gave away 10, 15 copies? All of a sudden, they start talking about it. There's a buzz. I didn't win the book. I didn't win Keith's book, but I'm going to buy it. Right? Here I was waiting for the, to, to win this, this contest or whatever. You know, the first 50. I didn't get it. And for, for three bucks, I'm going to go and grab it anyway. Press releases also have value. What we teach people, though, especially young writers, if you're going to have a press release, there's a significant difference between nonfiction and fiction. Nonfiction, you're going to attach something to an event, for the most part. Fiction is a little bit tough, though. Unless you have a name that's elevated, right? So even with all the success I've had, I have friends who write nonfiction and say, oh, Steve, you should do this and that. No, it's a waste of time. I'm better off sitting on my laptop and going after book bloggers in Sweden and in Thailand than to spend my time going after local press because they're only going to cover it so much. Hey, you know, hometown boy does good, right? Makes, makes good. Here, we just ran the press for this. Good for you, Steve. Unlike, you know, my first book was about the Gulf War, it was not fiction. Now all of a sudden, Memorial Day, 4th of July, that's just like you're attaching it to events, and people will cover that. Press releases are very, very effective. They're cheap if you know how to do them yourself. Uh, it can get expensive if you're going to hire people. And, but in, in some cases, it's worth that, depending on what audience you're going for, right? Especially if you're looking at something else. I know people. frequently have money at the end of their budget year. Um, yeah, if you want to put a package together of five copies because you want to let them give them away to the kids who come in, I mean, as raffle prizes or anything you can do to help the librarian or do what she has to do. Um, uh, so, okay. The quality and professionalism of your work is, this is my personal bugaboo with some of the things that I'm seeing. I have been with the Cape Cod Writers Center for four years as an interviewer for Books in the World and as a board member for a couple of years. And I, I have to say that the quality of the books that I see varies greatly, and it's very, very, you're with a um, hybrid publisher or whatever, if they don't know what they're doing, you have to know what, what they should be doing. If they don't know what they're doing, you yeah, gotta think twice about it. But I've seen books with editing problems, I've seen books with typos, type too small, margins too small, letting too small, writing no good. Um, all of this, will be immediately obvious to the They'll look at the book and they'll be polite, but they probably do not want it. It's, it's a matter of who's 
in a collection, that's another thing. If your book is an obvious status for came from, defines different things about patient health, could a good age level, I was just looking at your book, so it's all ages. It's all ages if you are reading to a kid, but if you have that budding um, seven, eight, nine, ten year old who can read that and is looking for content, you might be filling a gap in collections that maybe have lots of stuff for younger kids. Also, my, my haiku book, um, oh, yeah. oh, it fills a need oh, because the current few letters have much on haiku mm -hmm. and the beginning tells how to write haiku and what to look for. Mm -hmm. And so that has been helpful for me to, to fill a gap. Those are those are some thoughts about that. Um, so we haven't actually talked about events. How are you guys doing? Anybody have been invited to events or had any experience of giving book talks at libraries or how's it going? <laughs> Libraries experience, Duxbury happens to be one of the best, really, really fine. Um, I don't know if the young adult librarian was still there, but they had an excellent young adult librarian and uh, probably would have followed her just as good. Um, it does depend on the library's track record a lot, but for you, I, you know, it's always very disappointing when people don't show up for any of as a, as a librarian, you pray every time you invite anyone. You know, it could be someone well known, and it might be a bad night, or the subject well, is a thunderstorm. Exactly. Yeah. Or, or this Easter egg that comes across the street. Yeah. yeah. So that sounds like a personal experience right there. <laughs> you have to take your lumps in a way. You know, um, is it worth it? Going across the street. Is it worth it? That's the question. Is it worth it for you? Um, are you primarily interested in selling books? Well, of course you are. But you are also learning what people like, what they read, um, how you are presenting your book. Um, I know someone, um, Ann Hood is a popular fiction writer. She wrote a whole book about book clubs and book talks. She actually has a book on the map on called the book that matters most. Mm -hmm. And it's all based on her experiences going to libraries. So there's a lot of um, a lot to think about. You know, it's, it's really well, the other thing I always think too, you never know who's going to be sitting in the audience. Right. 
children's books, um, showing how you put them together, bringing the galleys, bringing the cover art. Um, even adults are interested in the Yeah. I mean, how often have you heard the question, and how long did it take to write yeah. this book? You know, it's these, everybody, I, I went to see um, Amor Towels, who wrote um, a gentleman in Moscow, I was telling him about this book best-selling author of uh, Boston Globe um, bestseller list. The first question people asked him was, how long did it take you to write yeah, this book? Okay. Yeah, people are interested in the process. So, um, so certainly if it's local, bring your friends. You know? um, I don't know how many of you know Arlene McKay, but she did a, she's a member of this organization. I think she emailed every friend she had on the cave a couple we all went, you know. <laughs> so she, was, she was doing a, a lecture on um, how to write a book, something like that. And it was, it was a little bit about her books. It was about how to write a book. So, so offer to be an expert, um, become, get interviewed on your local Cape and TV show. That's my, my bag with Cape Cod Writers Center. I don't have to tell you about your social media. Uh, that's what we're all working on to understand and know how to use. The, um, what was I going to say? Um, honoraria, that's a very thorny issue. Have, do any of you have experience of asking for money for going to a law firm? Doing what? Asking for money, asking for a, an honorarium? I didn't think you could. I have not paid many honorarium, <laughs> so. Um, well, what if nobody shows up? Well, you're right. Um, well, I've heard authors say that they won't go, so I'm just telling you if that's your standard, um, then you have to be prepared for rejection. Now, what is a what is a, a reasonable price? Start at fifty dollars. I wouldn't go for less. But uh, if you were if you were looking for it, if you are going to travel a hundred miles to go there, I think it might make some sense to ask to have your um, mileage covered, or if you have to stay overnight. I don't, you know, if, if you say you got invited to Lexington, you know, you're going to go, right? <laughs> you know, you you would you would be going, but you might try to ask for some compensation. Um, the bigger the library, the more likely that they would have money put aside for programs. Um, well, they will have money put aside for programs. There are people who are in the business of performing for libraries, so they do have money for storytellers and magicians and musicians and things like that. Um, authors certainly should be paid, but it's not typical, let me just put it that way, in the average display. Yeah, I think spend a lot less time putting together a program as a magician or a storyteller. Yeah. It gets paid. Yes. Well, this Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners has this performer's directory, and it does have a subheading for authors and illustrators. Does anyone look at it and use it? I can't tell. Why would you list your book there or yourself there? Why not? Um, I don't know. It's not a, it's not an easy game. So the um, have I, I think I've kind of covered those points. The the pieces that I
cut and paste from the web, I encourage you to look at all of them. I thought they were all very interesting. Um, and there, there's more. Uh, the self-publishing, how to get self-published books into the stores and libraries, very good. I didn't realize. You can have just one more. I'm just going to finish with it or I'll email it. I didn't realize there were actually services that you could subscribe to. Authors for libraries, $39. That's from the American Library. that I did put in these notes and you all, if you don't know about WorldCat, WorldCat is a database of all the holdings of the libraries uh, nationwide and not internationally. But if you just look up WorldCat on the internet, one of the things you'll see is that some of the larger, your book, for example, I don't know about you, Hugh, but some of the books that I looked up for local authors they were bought by large buying centers. Mm -hmm. You know, they weren't even necessarily appropriate, but they could be, you know, the New York State something or other, something or other. Uh, you could you could see that there is so much of automatic buying going on um, among the larger libraries. The other thing I noticed is that even things that were obviously Cape Cod related were not in many of Cape Cod libraries, mm -hmm. I, which meant to me, I have these notes somewhere about book sites of Duck, but it meant to me that the libraries are a market that is untapped for, you know, you must, anybody know C.L. Fornari, who wrote a book called Cape Cod Gardens? There's not many of them in Cape Cod libraries, which makes no sense whatsoever. So, will you sell uh, that book? I don't know. And then developing the readership and getting feedback from readers is also part of what you're looking for. Another angle I'm, I'm curious about. I went to, uh, I know that my book has uh, had a certain amount of success on Amazon and got and all that. So I happened to uh, visit Barnes & Noble said that, you know, I, I, my usual trick is I go, do you have this book? And they say, no, I'm happy. Well, I asked them because I'm going to be carrying it. And they have that sort of keyword that they want to have. It's absolutely true of magazines and newspapers. You're not going to get the so, so you can make a suggestion. Yeah. <laughs> and the more literary you kind of, well, is it, is it is the suggestion uh, <coughs> 
I, I, I'd be concerned that if I make a suggestion for the title I like, that it automatically will be that. I've had titles that I've just get used, but uh, it just because, because the editor wants to put it. It all depends on the editor. Yeah. <laughs> so I just, had a, I just I just I've been in advertising too long. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I had a series that I just finished. The last one came out on Monday for the coronavirus day. It was about distraction in the classroom, which is a huge topic. Yeah. Um, so I chose that title, The Distracted Classroom, but then, and there was four columns, but they chose that again, they, they, they wrote new subtitles for everyone, Distracted Classroom, colon, and then they, you know, there was yeah. an editor that made up all those subtitles. Just, just so that's, a question, like, that's a good one. Yeah, so again, you can think about the same strategy of the opening um, sentence, which is like, can there be something mysterious? I mean, the How to Lose a Boat is not a bad title either, because there's something curious about that. Like, there's something that makes you want to read more. So, essentially, a short version of the opening sentence strategy is one, but the other one is that you pull something concrete out of the essay, like that blue mohawk, right? And, like, that's the. Yeah, 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 right? Um, and, you know, you can find a way to, you know, touching the mohawk or something like that, right? Like, <laughs> reaching out to kind of. Know, to take that image and put it in the um, put it in a phrase or something like that. But you'll you'll notice that a lot of creative nonfiction essays titles um, something in the essay has been pulled out, and uh, it's, it's oftentimes something concrete as opposed to like a, a, a generic abstract. But the magazine uh, publications also sometimes they want to capitalize on that in the art. And the editors, they want to have the, in my experience has been the editors and the editors, they want to use their, they don't want my, my photographs or other things. They're going to have their own. Yeah. You know, you know, you know, you so you don't get to choose the cover of your book. It's zero in the time that anyone else. Um, okay, any last, I want to just ask you one last thing about what we want to do tomorrow. But any last <coughs> comments, questions about any of this? I think we've got some good ideas here. These are these are all pieces that we can push forward. So here's we have two options for tomorrow. Um, one would be um, you know, I would ask you sort of for your homework to think about a publication and to go out between now and tomorrow and just sort of identify okay here's one place that here's the that I would like to submit this to. Um, and what we would do tomorrow then is we would kind of just work on all right. So what is what do we need to do to get that? In Place, what's our pitch going to look like? Um, and trying to put together that pitch, and again, we do what we've been doing, which is I'll show you some principles, you know, perhaps get, hopefully by the end, we'll come out with that email ready to go. The other option would be to dig in more on the prose. Um, and so just sort of pulling together some principles for um, writing really strong, um, effective prose by drawing on some of the principles. There's a number of different things here. It's kind of, it's kind of we pull some of the stuff from the other class in English, which is about writing powerful, effective prose. Can we do both? That's I knew I knew someone was going to say that. Um, we can try. We can try. Um, I think we could split it into two hours. We could split the hour up and do a little bit of um, the prose piece first, and then shift that into working using those principles to put the pitch together. How about we do that? Yeah. Does everybody feel comfortable? Like you could do a little bit of Googling this afternoon and just try to find one place that you might want to pitch to. <laughs> and what we'll do then maybe is we'll pull some of those up and so we can all just look and see, okay, what are they asking for? How do we find out what they need here? But I'm going to show you kind of what I think a generic, um, what a generic pitch needs to contain. And we can work on grabbing some of that as well. All right? All right, let's go. <laughs>